ever at any point in y'all lives imagine Judy Garland having a fist fight with somebody? Baby, me either. Let me go ahead and plug my merch and tell y'all to go get some of my merch at ashleysaysso.net. The link will be in the description. Also, if you guys just want to send me gifts from my wish list on Amazon, that link is also in the description. Go ahead and listen to this disclaimer so we can get to this tea. The whole video is hearsay, rumor, and gossip that I find on TV, online, magazine, books, and I ball it all up and I tell you guys a story. It's all for entertainment purposes only. Now let's get to it. Francis Ethel Gum, aka Judy Garland, was born on June the 10th, 1922 in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Her mother's name was Ethel Marion Gum and her father's name was Frank Avent Gum. And on top of Judy, they had two more daughters. First daughter's name was Mary Jane Gum, and the second daughter's name was Dorothy Virginia Gum. And when we go back to the story of little Judy, baby, her life seemed like a mess from the start. First off, Ethel and Frank didn't even want Judy because they had two children already and they were struggling. So this meant when Ethel found out that she was pregnant, baby, she did everything to have an aborty. Gossip claims that she was drinking castor oil, riding over bumpy roads, even inserted some stuff to try to get rid of the child. In the end, everything felt, of course, and when baby Judy was born, calmer heads prevailed. In fact, Ethel started to look at Judy as less a mistake and more of a new idea. Now that she had three daughters, she decided that they should become a performing trio. And so they did. Judy and her two elder sisters became the gum sisters and they started to perform wherever they could. They worked tirelessly and were intent on making a big name for themselves, but there was somebody in their family that was working against them. And that was their father, Frank. And no, he was not intentionally trying to sabotage his daughter, but he kept the family on the move. Anytime the Gum Sisters would establish a name for themselves and people's tongues would get to wagging, Frank would burst through the front door telling everybody to get up and pack everything up because they had to leave town. And you would think his wife Ethel, who wanted so badly for her girls to become stars, would have put a stop to this. But baby, she was the first one packing up bags and hustling everybody out the door because Ethel knew when her husband Frank said it's time to go, it was time to go because Ethel knew her husband Frank was a gay man. And what Frank would do was move into these small towns and then get well acquainted with high school boys. And this would go on for a while until somebody in the community would find out, grab Frank and slam him up against the wall and tell him he needed to get out of town. They didn't have his kind there. And so they would have to get out of town. Now the Gum sisters, AKA Judy and her sisters had no idea what their father had going on. That is until one of them, I believe it was the eldest girl, Mary Jane overheard the local high school basketball star talking and joking with his friends telling them just how good old Frank Gums throaty body was. Let's move on. Now as the Gum sisters continued to grow and perform, the baby girl Judy, whom they called Babe at this time, started to sing with a voice that floored everybody because she was so young but she was singing with the tone and the vocal control of a grown woman so little judy became so popular that soon the promoters only wanted her for their shows and not her sister gossip claims on one of those shows the elder sister mary jane came out to perform and sing baby as soon as that girl got to send my regards to broadway remember me to harold somebody threw a uh, salami sandwich and bust that girl upside the head after that came a ham sandwich then a roast beef sandwich that baby looked like a meat lover's pizza when she walked off stage, but the audience had spoken. They didn't want no doggone Mary Jane. They wanted baby Judy. So since it was clear that Judy was the true star of the show, Ethel kind of stopped making it mandatory for the elder two sisters to perform all the time. And this was great for them, but terrible for Judy because Ethel was really, really becoming a high-strung showbiz stage mom. And then the woman was harsh a lot of the time. Like if she and Judy were on the road and Judy said something like, you know, mama, I wanna go home, I'm tired of this. Ethel would say, you just be quiet right now. As a matter of fact, you're being a bad girl. And then she would walk out of the hotel door, leave Judy in the room, and she would be gone for a long period of time. And the whole time, Judy would be in the room crying and scared to death, not knowing if her mama was gonna come back. And then when Ethel would come back, she would say things like, ain't you glad I'm back? You see what being a good girl gets you? And Ethel thought she was in the right by doing this. She felt like that it was her job as a mother to do everything she could to make her daughter a star 
star. And when I say Ethel went above and beyond to make sure her daughter would be a star, I should have said under and beyond. Because the folks say that she would take little Judy to auditions and casting calls. And once they were done auditioning, Ethel would say, okay, go outside and play for a minute. I got to talk to the men in the big suits over there. And baby, not five minutes after them girls would go outside, Ethel would be in that doggone audition room looking like a bobblehead shaking a maraca, honey. Just gulp, gulp, gulping it up, calling all poles from all angles, baby. What? Cha! A mess. But the folks say that mess got her girls to where they wanted to be. Allegedly, it got her so well connected that one of her connections ended up suggesting to Louis B. Mayer, the head of MGM, that he should go hear the Gum Sisters sing. And by this time, the Gum Sisters were actually going by the moniker the Garland Sisters. And when Louis did come by to watch, he was interested in only one of the Garland Sisters, the youngest sister, Judy Garland. So by the time Judy was 13 years old, she was to MGM. However, Judy had no idea just how rude and crude Hollywood could be. One of the first things that Judy heard when she signed on to work was that she was ugly. And baby, she heard it more than a few times. I'm talking about these people would have meetings in front of her talking about, for all, we all know that Judy is ugly, but you know, she can sing, she can dance. There must be something we can do with her little ugly self. I know. How about we put her in an ugly duckling role? You know, where she grows up to be a beautiful swan. Oh, wait, no. That's not going to work because she's still ugly in real life. All right. Maybe they didn't say all of that. But they definitely did have these meetings in front of her talking about her look. So imagine it, you are a 13 year old girl and everybody around you is saying you're ugly. Judy internalized it. She accepted and believed that she was ugly. So she was determined to make up for her looks by being the best darn actress anybody had ever seen. And while that is all great and good, the whole situation really is ironic because Judy Garland really was not an ugly girl. She just didn't look like the beauties of her day, but we'll get to that in a second. To get back to the current part of the story, the studio did find quick work for Judy. They cast her in girl next door roles with Mickey Rooney, looking to the public like a boy and a girl who were pretty much destined for each other, who were destined to grow up, fall in love, and get married. But behind the scenes, real life was nothing like that. Young Judy did develop a crush on Mickey Rooney, but Judy just really was not up to Mickey's standard. Mickey Rooney was getting it on with beautiful, grown Hollywood star. You can watch his video for the details and it's really sad because Mickey was already living the grown up life like I was telling you about but Judy did not want to live that life. She was trying to date boys her age but unfortunately the grown up life came for her. Those grown up studio head and managers maybe they were having a field day with young Judy. None more than Louis B. Mayer himself. Gossip claims that there wasn't a week that went by where Judy wasn't touched. And while most of those managers just kind of uh, felt and petted as they walked by, Louis B. Mayer had a very disturbing way of doing his dirt. The folks say that he would call Judy into his office and tell her to come sit up on his knee. And then he would tell her, you know, Judy, I am just enthralled with your singing. It's clear it comes from the heart. And then he would put his hand on her heart, which by this time was lumpy, if you get what I mean, and then tell her to sing. And while she was singing, he would stroke and caress her lumpy heart. On top of dealing with this mess, sometimes Judy would mess up and not perform up to studio standards. And studio standards meant children working 24 hours a day. So in order to keep Judy right and tight and up and perky for when she was shooting a scene, they started to give her caffeine, energy, and even amphetamine pills. And so what happens? Yes, now Judy is all hyped up and she can perform very well. But now when it's nighttime and it's time for her to go to sleep, she's still hyped up. So they started to give her sleeping pills and other barbiturates so she could go to sleep. So MGM turned Judy Garland into Frankie Lyman, if you catch my drift. And it's really sad because this baby had no idea that she was even being turned into this. In fact, them giving this medicine to Judy wasn't even a main concern for her. Her whole focus at this time was the weight she was gaining. Judy Garland at 14 and 15 years old started to become what the studios called 
pudgy. They made her stand in front of a mirror and basically said, look at yourself. Do you want to look like a fat slob or do you want to look like a sexy movie star? And so this child was laser focused on staying thin, but sometimes she would slip up. And after one too many slip ups, Louis B. Mayer decided to step in and he basically starved Judy Garland. All of her meals came from the cafeteria on the lot. And Louis B. Mayer would tell them, only feed her soup. If you feed her something else, you're gonna be fired. And that was on the days that she got soup. Some days she didn't get really nothing to eat. She only got something to drink. So it was really, really tough on Judy Garland. So this led to Judy looking for an outlet and that outlet was boys. And yes, she would huddle up and cover up when those grown behind managers would walk through. But when boys her age came through, baby, open. Actor Buddy Pepper kept Judy bent out of shape. Frankie Doro is another one that Judy started to sneak and visit in the night. And there was at least one other teenage male actor that she was getting up to no good with. So when the Wizard of Oz came about, when Judy was 16, she was nowhere near the little innocent plaited up hair girl that they portrayed her to be. This girl was getting it in. And I don't know if some of those munchkin actors on the Wizard of Oz felt like because they were small and short that they would look like teenage and maybe be attractive to Judy or something? I'm not sure, but honey, they tried it. Story says that the munchkins would have orgies and drinking parties with each other and baby invite Judy to join. And a few of them went so far as to put their hand up her dress. And just to give a little bit more tea about those munchkins, gossip claims that some of those female munchkins got arrested for trying to uh, prostitute on the set. Talking about follow the yellow brick road to get a piece of the midget pie. Baby, I can't. Really, the whole Wizard of Oz set was uh, filled with weird things and calamities. However, the movie The Wizard of Oz made Judy Garland an absolute star, but it also typecast her horribly. It made her America's little innocent sweetheart. But like I already told you, in real life, Judy wasn't an innocent sweetheart. Well, if the world found out, MGM feared that it would ruin Judy's uh, reputation and they feared even more the money they would lose. So Louis B. Mayer, with the help of Judy's mother, Ethel, put Judy under lock and key. Any going out and dancing that she had been doing, they stopped that. She was not to dress adult-like at all. In fact, they barely wanted her to dress like a teenager. And they certainly did not want her seen out in public with a guy. So Judy, under all of this pressure, did try to obey. But by the time she turned 17 and 18, she was done with this. And she basically came to Louis B. Mayer and was like, okay, I get why you want me to stay young and innocent because that is the way the public sees me but now I am growing up, so how about you make me into an adult star? She wanted him to cast her as a leading lady in a grown-up movie so she could wear those sensual slinky dresses and she could like cut her hair and have it curled. You know, she just wanted to be portrayed as grown up. Therefore, if she's portrayed as grown up, it wouldn't be really a shock to the public that she was living a grown-up life. Well, Louis B. Mayer told her something close to, oh, my little hunchback wanna be a leading lady. You wanna grow up? You wanna look sexy. Well, sorry for you, ugly. You ain't got the looks to be a leading lady. Your nose is too big. Your eyes are too far apart. Your shoulders are too wide. Your legs are too short. And your waist is too short. You don't have the glamour to pull off being a leading lady. So, you know, I hated to tell you all that, but why don't you just continue to try to be a good little girl? Just stay doing what you're doing. And this conversation hurt Judy to no end, but to compile on top of that, now she'd seen other stars her age who had started off as child stars or teenage stars, they were budding into voluptuous, beautiful women. People like Ava Gardner and Lana Turner, and actually, especially Lana Turner, because allegedly it was Lana Turner who Judy was most jealous of. She watched as Lana Turner walked on her sets and men drooled over her. While when Judy walked on the set, folks sitting up there saying, you know, hey Judy, how's it going today, kiddo? But her and Lana Turner are the same age. And allegedly this envy of Lana Turner soon turned into full-blown hate because gossip claims that Judy believed that Lana Turner stabbed her in the back. You see, around 17 years old, Judy was acquainted with this very handsome musician
musician named Artie Shaw. And when Judy first saw Artie Shaw, she wasted no time coming up and introducing herself. You know, they had a good conversation and they really became fast friends. But in Judy's mind, fast friends meant dating. Now the story says, while Judy and Artie did sometimes go out dancing, Artie was under the impression that he was dancing with a friend. Artie said there was never a time when he was attracted to Judy at all. Gossip claims that whenever he tried to give her a friendly peck on the cheek, she'd turn her lips to him and he'd tell her, you know, Judy, stop doing that. Or she would do things like see him talking face to face with somebody and then come through like, you know, excuse me boys and pump her booty out and try to touch his stuff when she slid through. And Artie told her to cut that out too. But no matter how much much Artie told Judy to stop that, you know, we're not doing that. She still had it in her mind that this guy loved her and she loved him. And one day she found herself talking to Lana Turner about this. She told Lana that she'd been talking to Artie Shaw and that, you know, she really liked him. And one day she felt like they were going to get married. Well, rumor has it that soon after that, Lana ends up going to an event and she ends up meeting Artie Shaw there for herself. And just like how Judy felt about Artie Shaw, Lana felt that about Artie Shaw. She thought he was magnificently handsome. The difference was is that Artie Shaw also felt fireworks about Lana Turner and they were so delighted by each other that on the same night that they met baby they took off flying for Las Vegas and got married. The next morning their pictures were splattered all over the newspaper saying that they had been married and Judy Garland lost her MF and mind. Cha gossip claims that Judy started ramming her head into a wall, started kicking at the air, slapping herself in the back of the head. Ethel, her mother, called Artie Shaw personally and basically told him off, said, you know, you broke my daughter's heart. And Artie didn't come over right then, but about three days later when he heard that Judy was threatening to take herself off of this earth, he did come over. But his words of comfort scarred Judy Garland even more because Artie told her, you know, come on, Judy. I do love you, but I love you as a friend. You have to understand, Judy, I had to marry a woman, a real lady, and Lana is a lady. And this right here shattered Judy's heart to pieces. Artie meant well, but what he did was cemented the fact to Judy Garland that she would never be looked at as this voluptuous, sexy figure. Heck, the way he was talking, she wouldn't even be looked at as a real lady. And although Judy had been on medication from the studios for at least four to five years at this point, after this whole ordeal with Artie Shaw, she started taking many more pills and different type of pills. And she also developed her second habit drinking alcohol. And another thing that Judy was determined to do after this whole Lana Turner and Artie Shaw debacle, she was determined to get married. If Lana Turner can sit up there and get married, then Judy could get married too. And so she was on the search, honey, for a husband. And she found him in a man by the name of David Rose. Now, David Rose was no Artie Shaw type. You know, he wasn't a very handsome man, but Judy thought he looked good enough. She also liked the fact that David Rose was a very calm and serious man. And Judy felt like this is exactly what she needed. A man that was serious. She had been controlled this entire time by her mother by the studio well now she was going to marry a strong man now she was going to be able to say well my husband said that he doesn't agree with that you know and I'm his wife I need to listen to my husband so Judy and David Rose get married in the year of 1941 and very soon after that Judy gets pregnant she calls her mother Ethel with the good news and her mother Ethel calls her right back with the bad news Louis B. Mayer is demanding that she gets rid of her baby Judy Judy tells her mama and Louis B. Mayer, absolutely not. This is my child. I am married. Well, Louis B. Mayer told her if she had that baby, she was finished. He was already upset with her getting married to David Rose. I didn't explain all that, but you know, he wanted to keep under lock and key and all of that good stuff. So he was already upset that she had done that. But a baby, he told her no, her image would be shot and he was not going to keep her own. So Judy is just sitting there thinking like, you know, shoo, wait till I tell David about this, honey, because my man, uh, uh, he ain't finna go for this. You know, this his baby. Well, she goes and tells David what Louis B. Mayer and Ethel are wanting. And David's sitting up there talking about some, oh, okay, so, so they want you to get rid of the baby, huh? 
Not strong, not supportive, not arguing, not even upset. In fact, as she talked to him further, David is kind of talking with the tone that, you know, maybe, maybe you should get rid of the baby. Judy is absolutely devastated. She has married pretty much a pansy in her eyes. And so she goes ahead and she gets the aborty. Not really because of Louis B. Mayer and her mother. Uh, she got it because she realized that she was no longer in love with David anymore. You know, this man was not who she thought he was going to be. And this is really just so sad. And what makes it even sadder is that next year she got pregnant again and there was another termination. And this time she didn't even tell David anything about the baby. She didn't cry, she didn't fuss, she didn't plead. She just went ahead and terminated it. And I know y'all are sitting out there like, you know, why should she tell her husband about the baby? You know, he didn't protect the first baby, but that's not it at all. The reason she didn't tell David about this baby is because it was Tyrone Powers' baby. Baby. Boom, baby. Scandal time. Baby, the folks say that Tyrone Power had been all up and through Judy's TT pretty much almost the whole time she was married. Said that Tyrone was head over heels for Judy because when they first started messing around, Tyrone told Judy straight up, hey, you know, I don't want you to have any surprises, so I want to let you know that I am a bisexual man. That means I like men and women. He expected Judy to pick up her clothes and run off. Child, Judy ran, all right, right back on top of that D. Judy was a freak, they said. When she officially divorced her husband David Rose in 1944, there was another young actor she was messing around with and he said Judy was up for all the smoke, said that she was giving him some throat bow goat and when he splashed his relief, he told Judy, uh-uh, I don't want you to spit or wallow. I want you to hold it and I want you to sing somewhere over the rainbow while you hold it. Baby, Judy Garland was up there bucky naked in the middle of the floor gurgling somewhere over the rainbow. But listen, the folks say that she stayed with a mouthful of kids' Jews. The folks say that Frank Sinatra lost so much stuff to Judy Garland's stomach that Judy got upset about it. Told a friend that Frank was wasting her time, that he always wanted the throat and not the stuff. And the friend was like, well, you know, Judy, some men would prefer that over that. Said Judy told her, well, shoo, he need to stop calling me because I feel like something wrong with him because what man don't like to... Now, although Judy was getting bent all kinds of out of shape, there was one man, Vincent Manelli, directing a picture that she was in and they couldn't get along. Well, all anybody knew is that one day the whole set cut to go to lunch and a few people came back from lunch early. Child, they messed around and looked at the prop bus that was on set and all they saw was Judy bent over looking like this and Vincent standing behind her doing the thrust 3000. So soon it was all over the lot that uh, Judy and Vincent were messing around with each other. And I don't know if this pushed her and Vincent to get married, but they did indeed get married soon after in the year 1945. And soon after this marriage, Judy became pregnant again and she kept the baby and named her Liza. And although Judy and Vincent adored Liza, after Liza's birth, their marriage started to crack. They grew very distant and became more business partners than actual lovers. And since this was the case, this left room for other lovers to infiltrate their life and it ended in a scandal, honey. There was one day when she was at the studio shooting a movie and she became tired all of a sudden and she went home early. She walks into her bedroom, kicks off her shoes and she's about to dive in the bed when she sees movement under the cover. She yanks back the cover and there is Vincent with his male best friend. Judy don't even say a word. She just takes off running to the bathroom with her hair blowing in the wind and starts slicing away at her arms. She is trying to take herself off the planet. When word spread around Hollywood, people didn't understand why Judy reacted this way when everybody knew that she was cheating with Yul Brenner and Orson Welles. People also wondered if Judy was really on a mission to take herself off of the planet because her husband had cheated or if it was because her addictions had become so bad that her reputation was on the downslide and people didn't even want to be around her. The folks say that Gene Kelly had messed around and injured himself while dancing and Judy Garland ended up showing up at his house for a visit. But when she got there, she suddenly became nauseous and said that she needed to vomit. So Gene told her, hey, there's a bathroom right down the hallway. Baby said Judy ran right past that bathroom and ran up his stairs to his personal private bathroom. She got up there making all these throwing 
cleaning up noises and heaving and coughing. And then she came out and told him that she was feeling better for right now, but you know, she needed to go home. She needed to rest. Gene Kelly thought it was strange, but he really didn't think much about the episode. That is until later on that day when he went up to his bathroom to get his medication for his injury, he found out that his medicine was gone. Judy had stolen it. She did Rosalind Russell the same way. Her behavior became too much for Vince and Manelli, so she and Vincent ended up getting a divorce in the year 1951. But in the year 1952, Judy got married again, this time to a man named Sidney Luff. And Sidney Luft was what some people would call a brute. You know, he was kind of a husky man and it was a lot of people warning Judy not to marry him. But what the people didn't understand is that this is the type of man that Judy wanted. She wanted a man that seemed like he could go against the whole world. She also liked Sidney because he wasn't as hard on her to stop her addictions as her other husband. In fact, Sidney liked to party and have a good time. The only thing he wanted Judy to do was continue to bring in the money. So Judy had a good time with Sidney, you know, and people were talking about Sidney being tough. Shoot, Judy felt like her and Sidney were Bunny and Clyde. She toughened up too with him. There's this one story about how she and Sidney were coming back from a party and they were both very sloppy drunk and they ended up hitting another car. Well, they were so out of it that they thought it was the other car's fault. So so both Sydney and Judy get out of the car cursing, you know, what's wrong with y'all? And a young man who was a passenger in that other vehicle got out of the car and was basically coming up to Judy to tell her, no, y'all are at fault. But before he can get it out, baby, Judy slapped him across the face, broke his glasses and everything. And when the driver of the other car got out, who I think was that boy's father, baby, see it drug that man all across the street, gave him all kind of black eyes and busted lips. It was so bad that Sydney was actually arrested and put in jail but the cops let Judy go. So Judy was very turned on by her little gangster boo Sydney, and soon she gave him two children, a daughter named Lorna and a son named Joey. But all of this freedom with her addictions and living this party life and fighting folks with her husband, all this stuff was starting to take a toll on Judy. For one, she was only in her 30s but the girl started to look like she was 60 years old. And for two, because they were living this high life and partying all the time and see it like to spend so much money, Judy very quickly became broke. And so because she looks like an elder lady at 30 and because she is losing a lot of money, she becomes even more depressed and so she does even more uh, drugs and booze. One time she was so out of her mind that she was standing in her living room talking to her assistant when all of a sudden she stopped talking, froze up and just fell face forward into a glass table, went straight through it, baby, had cuts all over her face and everything. Then you got the rumor about when she had a show in Nassau, Bahamas, and Judy was in her hotel room and she got so sky high that she ended up going outside on her balcony in see-through lingerie and singing her song. And I know y'all are sitting out there like, you know, dang, I know her husband let her do all this, but it should have been somebody around here that should have cared for her, should have took those pills away from her. The person that tried it, got a knife pulled out on her. And no, I'm sorry, the lady who was Judy's assistant didn't take the pills. Judy thought she took the pills and pulled out a butcher's knife and chased that woman around the house. This same assistant right here said one time she was driving Judy somewhere and as she's driving, baby, she starts to feel a hand rubbing up and down her thigh all on her knee and then suddenly go in between her the assistant didn't know what to do, but she said she was very uncomfortable. As Judy's life went lower and lower into the skids, stories started to sweep all over Hollywood about how Judy was constantly either overdosing or slicing her arms up. I mean, y'all, it's like the woman was intent on taking herself here. She had a show in Australia one year and she got on stage very high and very drunk and she wouldn't sing and she was directing the band and so the people in Australia booed her. Judy left the stage, went to the bathroom and took a handful of and not only was Judy over medicating and slicing and dicing herself, she also had a habit of setting herself on fire because Judy would be so drunk and so high and then she would try to light a cigarette and then she would drop it. In 1953, she set her whole cottage on fire. In 1956, she dropped her cigarette on her nightgown and ended up burning her legs up. By 1959, Judy had ruined her body so much that she was in the hospital swollen up like a balloon. She had lost the use of 
of her limbs, she couldn't think straight, and her liver was retaining fluid. Fluid was no longer leaving her body. Everybody thought it was the end game for Judy. However, the doctor decided to try to drain the fluid, and he did for seven weeks straight. And this is what saved Judy's life. Judy went right back to what she had been doing, and then she and her husband, Sidney Luff, divorced in 1965. And also in 1965, Judy thought she finally found her soulmate. This guy's name was Mark Heron. Judy married Mark Heron and found out very quickly that he was just a gay man that was a fan of hers. Mark liked to hang around Judy and talk to Judy, but he would not make love to her. So Judy did what she thought was best, which was light a match in Mark Heron's closet and set all his clothes on fire. Once Judy's marriage to Mark Heron failed, I think she was really just kind of disillusioned with life. Her behavior had already been atrocious, but now it just became kind of deviant. The folks say that she started treating her house staff horribly. She would curse at her maids and talk down on them and kind of like push them around. And when one of her maids decided to quit, Judy threw a plate at that woman and then took a turkey leg and started busting the woman upside the head. When the woman finally was able to get out of her grip and run and get in her car to drive away, Judy picked up a big old rock and threw it at the woman's windshield. And then one story says that her children's nanny was ironing the children's clothes when Judy came out of nowhere, called the woman trash and kicked her in the leg and started trying to beat the woman around the head. Child of folks say that woman picked up that hot iron and started swinging it all kind of ways in Judy face. Baby Judy teleported upstairs and locked herself in the bedroom. But even after that, she still tried to play tough. Gossip claims that when the nanny got in the car to leave, Judy came back outside and threw a butcher knife at this woman's car. And the folks say that Judy even put the hands on a man's wife that she was messing with. David Beagleman, who was Judy's manager at the time, started to have an affair with Judy. Well, his wife, Lee, found out and showed up at the hotel where they were staying, and she ended up knocking on Judy's door, expecting to find her husband in there. Baby, what she found was Judy's fist. She started to mollywop that doggone woman. But rumor has it, by the end of the fight, it was Lee who was on top of Judy, busting Judy Judy all upside the head. Both women were stripped down to their bra and panties when the fight was over and both of their faces were bloody. And I know I've said this a million times throughout this story, but I don't know what else to say. Judy just let the drugs consume her. She was so messed up that Liza grew up not wanting anything to do with her. And then Judy chased her two youngest children away, literally. Allegedly, Judy got up out of bed one night out of nowhere hallucinating. And she hallucinated that her son, Joey, was an intruder and she picked up a knife and chased her own son, I think he was around 11 years old, chased him around the house trying to kill that boy. Joey literally ran out of the apartment that they were staying in at that time at 3 a.m. in the morning and ran down the street to a payphone to call his daddy to tell his daddy to please come and get him and his daddy did. Now Judy's daughter Lorna tried to stay with her mother and be there for her mother but it just became too much for her especially the number of times that she found her mother overdose. The folks say that Lorna knew how to use a portable stomach pump that Judy had at the house just for her because she would OD. It just became a mess. There's really a ton of stories about Judy Garland's behavior, but all through the 1960s, it was just a mess. You know, uh, Judy screwed up all of her money. She had signed on to do the movie Valley of the Dolls, but when she read her character, she didn't like it because she felt like her character was too evil. So she went and talked to the director about changing it, and the director told her no. Judy went to her dressing room and OD. When she never made it back to the set and the director came back to the dressing room, he was confronted with Judy laying out with her skirt hitched up with TT hair blowing in the wind. And of course, Judy was fired for this. There was another time when she had signed a contract with ABC to appear on one of their shows, but one night she didn't feel like appearing because she said she had laryngitis. Well, the people at ABC told her she had to come out on the show because she signed the contract, so Judy went to her dressing room and drew all over the walls with lipstick. She put cigarette butts everywhere. She even flooded the toilet and the sink. So she was just out of control. Like I said, you know, she was out of control and she lost all of her money. She ended up losing her house. She moved into hotels and she relied on fans to pay her rent sometime. It was just a life full of scandal. 
However, on March the 15th, 1969, Judy Garland got married for the last time. And this was to a man named Mickey Dean. And Mickey Dean's was another one, just like her ex-husband Sidney Luft, that did not care that Judy continued to abuse pills and alcohol. And this was probably one of the reasons why only three months later, Mickey ended up waking up from a nap and finding his wife sitting in the bathroom on the toilet with her head down down like this and her hands just propped on her knee. Mickey thought Judy was just asleep or unconscious again like she was a lot of the times until he tried to call her name and she wouldn't respond. So he ended up walking over to her and he lifted up her face like this and at first he breathed a sigh of relief because Judy breathed. But as it would turn out, that breath was actually just air that had got trapped up in Judy's chest and her throat while her face was leaned down like this. Judy actually had been dead on that toilet for several hours and that breath that came out was her last breath. Judy Garland had overdosed for the last time. And what makes this so ironic is that this time it was a mistake. She wasn't even trying to overdose, didn't even take a big amount of pills. But what happened is that all of her drug use in the past had built up over the years. So that became a lethal dose and caused Judy to pass away. And if gossip is to be believed, Gerald Levert passed away very similar to this. So with Judy Garland, I really don't know what to say about her story. Yes, it was a scandalous thing, child. But you know, I just feel like a lot of stuff happened in her childhood and that she had a deep pit of sorrow inside of her that she didn't know how to deal with. And unfortunately, in the end, it destroyed her. And what's even more sad is that Judy was only 47 years old at her time of death. But child, I don't know. Tell me what y'all think in the comments. We are finally at the end of the Judy Garland video. If you guys enjoyed it, go ahead and hit the like button. If you guys are new here, go ahead and subscribe. And if anybody missed the DIY video I did with my mom where she played my song I recorded, it will be linked in my top comment. I love y'all. Bye.